good day ladies and gentlemen this is dr frere your professor our topic is on the second part of the industrial revolution it was known that necessity is the mother of invention and out of necessity several things have been invented resulting to industrial revolution particularly in Europe one of which is the spinning machine this is a machine which process prepared cotton roving it into yarn or thread so this is necessary in order to speed up the weaving and another is the power loom it was also being created during the time of the industrial revolution power loom was designed to weave threads into cloth designed by Edmond Cartwright in 1784 this power loom increased demand for raw cotton that's why it resulted to the invention of the cotton gin cotton gin is a short word for cotton engine this is a machine that quickly and easily separates cotton fibers from seeds. So because of the invention of the cotton gin, it demands for stronger iron and improvements in iron smelting and the development of steel by Bessemer process. So as a result, as more steam-powered machines were built, Factories needed more coal to create this steam and out of that it resulted to mining methods that improved to meet the demand for more coal. The now let's summarize the birth and the growth of the textile industry. Well, let's start with uh, the invention of uh, John Kay. It is known as the Flying Shuttle in 1733. This is a hand-operated machine which is being used to increase the speed of weaving. Another invention was the Spinning Jenny in 1765 by James Hargraves. It is a home-based machine that is spun thread eight times faster than when it is being spun by hand. Next, in 1769, water frame was invented by Richard Arkwright. This is a water-powered spinning machine that was too large for use in a home, and because of this, it led to the creation of factories. By then, Samuel Crompton invented a spinning mule in 1779. This combined the spinning jenny and the water frame into a single device that increased the production of fine thread. Then, of course, the power loom in 1785 by Edward Cartwright, a water power device that automatically and quickly wove thread into cloth. Next is the cotton jean in 1793 by Ellie Whitney, who was an American. And this device separated raw cotton from cotton seeds that increases the cotton supply while lowering the cost of raw cotton. And last was the sewing machine uh, in 1846 by Elias Hoy, an American also. This is speed of the sewing of uh, textiles. So these machines were so large and uh, households can no longer accommodate this in their homes. So these machines are being placed in large buildings called factories. Now let's proceed with the development of steam engines. This is an early water power involved mills built over fast moving streams and rivers. But of course, there are problems associated with this invention, such as uh, rivers are far removed or not enough power, or rivers are prone to drying. So, this is actually by James Watt uh, from Scotland in 1769. And this is an improvement of uh, 
the steam engine uh, used by or discovered by new coalmen no, to power machinery. By 1800s, steam engines replaced water wheels as source of power for factories. So, as a result, factories have to relocate near raw sources of raw materials for near workers and or from ports. So out of that, uh, cities have to grow. No? They grow around the factories which are being built near central England's uh, mining sites, particularly that of coal and iron, particularly in Manchester and Liverpool. Now let's move with transportation. Uh, because of invention of transportation, this of course increased the production of goods and uh, the producers can now search for more markets outside their location and or sources of their raw materials. And uh, because of these needs, this resulted to better and faster means of transportation. If you can remember, before the Industrial Revolution, the mode of transportation is by the use of canal barges you know, that are being pulled by mules or by some ships powered by sails or by horse-drawn wagons, carts, and carriages. But after the Industrial Revolution, this mode of transportation was being replaced by trains, by steamships, by trolleys, or of course, automobiles. So now let's go back to the transportation revolution. It was actually during the 1800s when Robert Poulton, an American, invented the steamboat. Now this is uh, a speed water transportation. It was followed by Thomas Telford and John Mark Adam. They were British and um, they actually proposed the macadamized roads from 1810 to 1830. These are actually improved roads whose intention is for the producers of goods to market their products or to buy raw materials, but of course for people also as a means of transportation. And it was in 1825 when George Stephenson uh, from England, of course, introduced the locomotive, more fast land transport for of people and of uh, uh, goods. And in 1885, a German inventor invented the, got the gasoline engine. As in the person of Gottlieb Daimler, this led to the invention of automobile. Then in 1892, another German inventor uh, and the person of Rodolf Diesel invented the diesel engine. This is more a cheaper fuel for automobiles. Of course, you are familiar with this brothers. Orville and Wilbur Wright, Americans, who invented the airplanes in 1903 as a mode of air transport. Now let's move with communication revolution. It was in 1844 when telegraph was being invented by Samuel Morse, who's an American, and this resulted to rapid communication across the continents. Then it was followed by Alexander Graham Bell, an American also, who invented the telephone in 1876 that resulted to uh, human species being heard across the continents. And of course, another American invented the Atlantic Cable the person of Cyrus Field. This made United States and Europe 
connected by cable. And by 1895, an Italian inventor invented a wireless telegraph. This is an early form of radio. No wires are needed for sending messages through this invention by Guglielmo Marconi. And another American invented a radio tube in 1907, the person of Lee the Forest. By then, radio broadcasts could be sent around the world. And finally, in 1925, another American and the person of Vladimir Zorikin invented a television that made simultaneous audio and visual broadcasts around the globe. Now let's proceed with the spread of industrialism. Actually, Great Britain or Britain attempted a monopoly during the Industrial Revolution, meaning a total control of the industry. But the skilled workers and inventors saw the opportunity to make more money elsewhere, so the ideas and plans were being leaked out of Britain. So now let's see how that idea subreads uh, so from England it reaches the United States, Germany, and Japan. We have known that Industrial Revolution began in England because of the availability of their natural resources, cheap labor, and markets for selling goods. So as a result, Great Britain became an industrial powerhouse in the 18th century, which kept them in the lead for world power. Though Britain tried to keep a monopoly on the industry, inventors and innovators took their ideas elsewhere, and they sold their ideas for money. So let's take the case of the United States. Samuel Slater slipped out of Britain in 1789, and by that, he took his knowledge of spinning to Rhode Island. As a result, in 1814, Lowell opened a textile mill in Massachusetts. This factory system spread to New England. So the North became industrialized, the South reeled on cotton sales to mills in New England and Great Britain. While in Germany, Germans bought British machines in the early 1800s. As a result, in 1839, Germany used British capital to build its first major railroad. They have coal, iron, and textile industries emerged in the mid 1800s. So by 1870, Germany, Great Britain, and the United States were the world's three most industrialized nations. While in Japan, Commodore Matthew Perry arrived in 1853 with a fleet of steam powered warships exposing Japan to the power of industry. So by late 1800s, Meiji leaders pushed for industrialization. Japan built its first railroad in 1872. And by 1914, Japan was one of the world's leading industrial powers. Now let's proceed with the effects of industrialism. One is the growth of cities. From where factories are situated, people have resided due to works, then cities have emerged. Second is the rise of capitalism, or the privately owned businesses, corporations, and methods of organizing businesses being introduced. Next is the rise of the working class. When we say working class, these are workers employed in manual or industrial work. Another is it gave birth of trade unions. When we say trade unions, we are speaking of the association of workers in factories or today we have in high-end corporations. 
and uh, the development of socialism or uh, this uh, it's the government that owns the business so as entrepreneurs sold shares of stock or rights of ownership this businesses became corporations and by that it gives the ability to raise large amounts of capital famous for this is the standard oil or standard oil company and trustee by john rockefeller in 1870 to 1911 this corporation controls almost all oil production processing, marketing, and transportation in the United States. Then another is the Carnegie Steel. This is a steel producing company created by Andrew Carnegie during the late 19th century. At the same time, Europe industrializes. William Cockerell made his way to Belgium his son built large industrial textile. Germany had pockets of industry because uh, of the imported British engineers and die built railways. Another is regions in Europe began to industrialize. Example is the Northern Italy textile. And of course, social structure and geography halted elsewhere. Now let's proceed with the impact of industrial revolution. One is industrialized countries exploited overseas markets for resources. And this gave way to imperialism. When we say imperialism, this is the extension of power and dominion by gaining political and economic control over another country and this imperialism gave Europe great power and as a result it developed a middle class in Europe when you say middle class this are peasants who form a new bourgeois due to mercantile ventures and also it created a movement for social reform when we say social reforms these are changes that aims to bring social or political system closer to the community's ideal famous for these reforms are the philosophers in the name of adam smith karl marx and friedrich engels Adam Smith was known for his belief in laissez-faire. This is an economic policy of letting owner of industry and business working conditions without interference of the government. Adam Smith was known by writing his famous book entitled The Wealth of Nations. So this gave way to the concept of capitalism, an economic system in which the factors of production are privately owned and money is invest invested in business ventures to make a profit. Another known philosopher was Thomas Malthus, who wrote an essay on the principle of population. According to him, epidemics and wars are necessary and his Malthusian theory speaks for this concept that population growth is potentially exponential while growth of food and other resources are linear and of course we have David Ricardo who was also known for his principles of political economy and taxation, a permanent underclass, that according to David Ricardo, land rent grows as population increases. We also have Jeremy Bentham, 
he proposes or proposed utilitarianism. According to him, people should judge things based on their usefulness or utility. That according to him, individuals should be free to pursue interest without interference of the state. He even questioned unregulated capitalism. What is this unregulated capitalism? This is one which is being dominated by free markets and private ownership of wealth with financial deregulation, privatization, and lower tax on high earners. Then we have also Robert Owen who proposed for utopian Then we have Robert Owen. He was a utopian leader, leader who proposed for improved working conditions and attempted to create utopia in Indiana. When we say utopia, this is an imagined community that possesses highly desirable or nearly perfect qualities of its citizens. But I guess, class, this belief of Robert Owen is beyond um, possibility. An imagined community where people are highly, are possesses highly desirable or nearly perfect qualities. Then among the French reformers, we have Charles Forer, one of the founders of Utopian Socialism. Another was Henry de Saint Simon, a political, economic, and social theorist who influenced politics, economics, sociology, and philosophy in France. And uh, also as a socialist, He also believed on socialism where factors of productions are owned by the public and operate for the welfare of all. And of course, I know you are very familiar with Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels due to their book titled The Communist Manifesto. So they discuss the middle class, they call them with halves or the bourgeois and the have nots or the workers or the proletariat. So, both philosophers predicted that the workers would overthrow the owners of production. Karl Marx believed that factories would drive small businesses out, leaving a number of manufacturers to control all wealth. So, proletariat would revolt and a classless society would develop. And this what we call communism today. This is a class war leading a society in which all property is publicly owned and each person works and is paid according to their abilities and needs in that all goods would be shared equally by the citizens. Now let's have the consequences of industrial revolution. Prior to industrial revolution which began in Britain in the late 1700s, manufacturing was often done in people's homes using hand tools or basic machines. So, with the advent of industrialization, it marked a shift to powered, special-purpose machinery, factories, and mass production of goods. So, these are the major consequences of the Industrial Revolution. One is increase in labor productivity. All kinds of products became mass cheaper in terms of labor time needed to produce them or buy them. Machines make it cheaper to make things so there is an increase of supply. 
Another is ecological consequences, and this includes population growth and environmental changes. Speaking of population growth, there, is an, there was an enormous human explosion that has happened in the last two centuries. In 1750, the earth had less than 800 million people, but today, this number has increased to 7 7 billion, which needs a much higher consumption of goods and energy per head of population. And speaking of environmental changes, the total carbon emission has increased due to burning fuels, black smokes, which increased more than hundred folds in the last century. And for technological advancement, this includes the invention of the steam engine, which is being used in shipping, in trains, in airplane. Then increasing use of electricity or source of power. Next is the emergen, emergence of chemical industry or companies that produces industrial chemicals. Another is the use of destructive forces in weapons, particularly nuclear weapons. And of course, the advanced transportation. We have light rail, commuter rail, we have traffic management systems, busways, subways, bus transit, advanced transportation facilities, and etc. And of course, Manufacturing inventions. Today we have industrial robots, we have robotics, or the use of 3D printing, and uh, others. And for social consequences, of course, we have a capital market system where private individuals own capital goods and an increasing industrial working class. Today we have. Uh, uh, increased number of uh, workers engaged in wage or salaried labor and uh, a reduced number of agricultural farming that's why we experience a uh, lack of food supply uh, due to this reduced number of farmers that produces these products or basic necessities and another is labor exploitation, particularly in uh, factories that hires uh, minors uh, in the, as their em employees. And uh, uh, changing working condition unless the, their employment has uh, contracts or a collective bargaining agreement which they can which employer cannot easily change working conditions for their workers. And uh, of course, another social consequence is greater accessibility, particularly with uh, products being made accessible almost to all people. Okay class, so that would be uh, for the last uh, part of Industrial Revolution. And for your activity for this uh, part of the lesson, uh, assuming that you are either a factory worker, a philosopher, an inventor, an engineer, or any position during the Industrial Revolution, what do you think was your contribution to this period? Discuss your assumed role and present your output and a collage showing you in your role as well as your contribution. You have one week to prepare your output. Okay, thank you class for watching this video. See you in the next video.